the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, too, and I have a special announcement to make to you today. What is that? Well, you know the American Weekly, don't you? Oh, yes. It's a magazine that comes with the, the same paper that the comics are in, and my father and mother read it all the time. Well, you just tell them that next week we're going to have a special announcement for them that's going to make them very happy. What's the announcement going to be? Oh, if I told you that now, it would spoil the special surprise. Can't you just whisper it in my ear? Mm, that would just spoil the fun for you. I promise I won't tell. Well, I know you won't, but you might talk in your sleep. Oh, all right. I'll wait. I could tell them, though, that, that we'll have the surprise announcement. Oh, be sure to tell them that. All right. And I'll even have them listen to us next week so they'll be able to hear the special announcement. And I know they'll be very pleased and very happy. Oh, I know they will because you make me always very pleased and very happy. So will you please make me pleased and happy today by reading the funny? Fuck the comic weekly. Mm -hmm. I will in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And at the top of the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Two crooks had stolen the deed to Buck Peter's ranch and tried to get out of town with it. Hoppy had gone after the crooks and captured the one who had the deed. And he's brought him back to the Bar 20 Ranch, where they've held him a prisoner. In the middle of the night, the other crook slips into the shed and releases his pal, who has been tied to a post. He whispers, I saw your capture from the train window. I jumped off and doubled back here to the Bar 20. They go to the door. Last picture top row, they open the door and see Hop along and Buck coming toward it. Hey, quick, the rear door, they're onto us. Run to the rear door and see Lucky in California and some ranch hands coming toward it. As Lucky steps in the door, they push a stack of feed bags at him. And in the confusion, they run to a window and climb out. First picture bottom row, Lucky spots them far off, heading for two horses staked out in the brush. Hoppy and the others run for the corral for their horses. But they find that the corral is empty. California says, hey, It's too late. Our horses were turned loose to block pursuit. The buzzards were too smart for us. Buck Peters replies, Well, let him go. I still got the deed to that Wyoming homestead. Hoppy says, Yeah, and they've got the information that you and Rose will be heading north to claim that property. Well, then I might be riding that trail straight into trouble, Hoppy. Hoppy answers, last picture. Yes, but that's where you will pull them. So do I. I hope it's a good one, because those outlaws were clever to escape when they were surrounded. They were. We'll find out next week what Hoppy's scheme is. Now? Well, now, could we please read Prince Val? We certainly could, so let's go over the page to page three. And here he is, and, and they're having a bird-catching contest. Yes, it's called the falconry contest. Val, Alita, and the king have each trained a bird to catch other birds. And whatever their birds catch, they've got to eat for dinner that night. And <laughs> oh, poor Val, his bird has caught a crow. And I've never heard of anyone eating a crow. <laughs> Neither have I. So let's read now where Prince Valiant has to eat here. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> As Val holds up the crow his bird has caught, a shout of laughter goes up. Everyone knows that Val has to eat that crow for dinner that night. And now that the contest is over, Val, Alita, and the king turn their hunter birds loose. For having been trained for this one hunt, they've done their part and have won their freedom. But Alita's beautiful little Merlin comes back to Alita's wrist. 
it seems that little Merlin has fallen in love with her mistress and wants to stay with her. Last picture, second row, the hunters sit at their table and their food is brought to them. The king's eagle has caught a heron, a very tasty bird. Alita has a delicious partridge. But when Val's crow is set in front of him, it looks like nothing but a crow. But Val's a good sport, and he begins to eat. At first picture, bottom row, he finds that it's very delicious. And then he realizes it tastes like a partridge. And he knows that his sweet wife, Alita, has played a double joke on him. She's had the cook put the tasty meat of the partridge under the crow's feathers and skin. And Val enjoys a delicious meal. After dinner that night, a commotion is heard outside the castle. And then in comes Rufus Regan, battle-scarred and travel-stained, home from the long overland journey from Rome. In last picture, Val tells Alita, Rufus has brought with him the Christian missionaries, and now we can have the twins properly christened. Oh, wasn't that nice of Alita not to make Val eat the crow? Yes, it was. Oh, and now the missionaries have come at last, and, and they can baptize the babies. Wouldn't that be nice? You bet it will, and we'll find out some more about that next week, I'm sure. Could we please read Flash Gordon now? Because, remember, Flash has been captured by those giants who are trying to conquer the world. And rescue rockets from the Earth have been sent to search for Flash. But the giants have seen the rockets coming, and they're ready to attack them. All right, let's read now and see what happens. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rigga rigga doon doon, sashkamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. The rockets from Earth speed toward the moon Rhea. Suddenly they see the enemy rocket speeding toward them. Strapped to a chair under the brainwave recording apparatus, Flash can only gaze helplessly at the space scanner, watching Rhea's armada attack the outnumbered rescue rockets from the Earth. And he hears the king bark terse orders, spelling the doom of the tiny earth fleet that is already reeling under heavy blows. <laughs> On board his flagship, Icy Stark is appalled as he sees the havoc wrought by the Rian guns. Frantically, he orders his surviving rockets to break off the unequal battle. Hunter, Hunter, head back, work. Last picture top row, as the struggle rages... A gun spotter in Dale's rocket is gravely wounded. Quickly, she takes his place in the turret, helping her crew fight a rear guard action against the swarming attackers. But first picture bottom row, wave after wave of the Rian ships come diving in with guns blazing to cut off the Earthmen's escape. And the battle becomes a rout. Suddenly, there's a burst of flame as one of the Rian missiles scores a near miss on Dale's ship. The craft rocks crazily and then disintegrates. And Dale is hurled out of her shattered gun turret into space. The enemy armada herds the remnants of Stark's crippled fleet back toward Rhea. Meanwhile, last picture, Dale drifts alone through space, her precious supply of oxygen leaking slowly from its damaged container. As she floats down, Dale sees a tiny sphere approaching. It's a mere fragment in space, spinning slowly in its orbit around Saturn. Desperately, she grabs at it, and her fingers find a precarious grip. Now I'll bet that Icy Stark is sorry he didn't listen to Dale before. Yes, I'll bet he is, too. And just because of his stubbornness, Dale is lost in the air. And she can float like that for a long, long time. And if all the oxygen is, escapes, then she won't be able to breathe because there isn't oxygen up there so high. You're absolutely right. You remember everything you learned about outer space, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll find out next week what happens to Dale. Maybe the giants will capture her and bring her back to Flash. I hope something happens so she won't be left like that forever. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now let's go to the first page of the second section. Oh, and Dagwood and Blondie. Yes, let's see what silly thing Dagwood does today. <laughs> Very well, here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Say the magic words with me, please. Ramapoo, ramapum, zim, zam, zombie. Come to me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood is enjoying his newspaper when Blondie trips into the living room and says... 
having cream potatoes for supper, and I have no parsley to sprinkle on them. Oh, what's the difference? You can't taste the parsley anyway. I know it, but a little parsley looks so nice on cream potatoes. Dagwood gets his hat and coat and says, Okay, I'll get you some. As he goes out the door, last picture top row, he says, Is there anything else you want while I'm at the store? No, dear, just the parsley. <laughs> A few minutes later, he's going down the street. First picture, second row, he hears... Uh Uh-oh, what's going on? I hear shooting. He looks over his shoulder and sees a robber dashing down the street, followed by police. Hey, they're coming my way. Last picture, second row, they head straight for Dagwood. Dagwood, who doesn't want to get shot, at least in the front, turns around and dashes off down the street beside the robber. Around the corner they go. First picture, next row, they dash down an alley. All right, we got them cornered. They can't get away. And a short time later, Dagwood and the burglar are brought into the police station in chains. Dagwood faces the police chief and he says, last picture, third row. I, I, I wasn't doing anything, Captain. I was just walking down the street. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. And the police chief says, okay, okay. I won't hold you. You can go. First picture, bottom row. Dagwood comes in the house. Hey, Blondie, wait, Blondie. Something terrible happened. I got caught in a cop and a robber chase. They took me to jail. I'm lucky to be alive. And Blondie asks... Did you bring the parsley? Oh, my goodness. I forgot the parsley. Last picture, Blondie turns to the children and says... I ask him to bring one little thing and he forgets it. And Dagwood goes... (laughs) (laughs) Didn't he look funny when they brought him into jail? Yes, one thing about Dagwood. No matter how sad he looks, he always looks funny. (laughs) Yes. Well, now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, read that, please, because Roy is starting a new adventure. I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words by the music, please. Very well, my lady. Hi yip hi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi Roy and his friend Chubby were riding along the trail when they came upon a broken wagon. They saw tracks leading to a nearby water hole. They followed the tracks. At the sound of an approaching horses. A girl who's at the water hole quickly powders her nose and then arranges herself on the ground as though she has fallen in a faint. Roy and Chubby discover the girl lying there. They dismount and splash water on her. She comes to and tells them that her name is Nadine Drake, that she's on her way to Sagebrush Bend to apply for the position of schoolmistress. Chubby says, I'm the hombre you gotta see about that there job, miss. Because I built that schoolhouse. When Miss Drake hears this, she tells Chubby that everyone has heard of him and his fabulous mansion. Last picture, top row, Roy says, "Uh, My name's Roy Rogers, Miss Drake. I'll ride back to the busted wagon and fetch your bags and the horse. First picture, bottom row, Roy discovers that the wagon is gone. He sees a cloud of dust where the trail curves behind a huge rock. He lights out after it. Meanwhile, in the wagon, the driver is saying to another man, Well, it worked, Gaucho. If that rich desert rat swallowed Nadine's story, they're already on their way to his hacienda. Ah, she's a smart girl. At this moment, the man named Gaucho looks back and sees Roy approaching and exclaims, Hey, caramba! Senor Dormiton, we are in trouble. We recovered the wagon too soon. A strange cowboy chases us. The driver whips up his horse. Hey, get up there. Get up there, will you? Come on here. Get up there. Hang on there, Gaucho. Get up. Get up. As he swerves around the curve, 
The wagon wheel breaks. And last picture, the wagon and the men are plunged over the cliff. Hey, Caramba, look out! For that thing you don't! Look out! Roy gallops up and reins in, looks over the cliff and exclaims, Well, Miss Drake's wagon is gone for sure this time, and those road agents with it. Like she was subconscious just so she could be taken to Chubby's house. Yes, I wonder what her game is. Well, it must not be nice when if, if those men who were in the wagon didn't want to be caught by Roy. You figure that out very cleverly. Yes, I do, do I? You do, you do. Thank you. You're welcome. And maybe next week we'll find out a little more about what this girl is up to. Now, let's go over the page. Oh, look, there's Donald Duck. What does he do today? Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze the chicka jack. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald is going out for lunch today. He looks in the paper and he sees that it says it's going to rain. So Donald decides to take his umbrella with him. He goes out the door and locks his door behind him. And by the time you can say, a double banana split with a chocolate soda on it, Donald is downtown at a restaurant finishing his lunch. First picture, bottom row, he goes to a hat rack, takes down his hat, and grabs an umbrella hanging there. When a big bruiser standing beside him says, hey, just a minute, pal, that's my umbrella. Donald just gives him a dirty look, and then starts for the door. And the man grabs the umbrella. Donald yells, Why, you old crook, let go. That's my umbrella. The man answers, Don't kid me, chiseler. And jerks the umbrella out of Donald's hand. And he goes out the door. Donald follows him outside where it's raining. He yells, I'll have the law on you. And the man walks down the street saying, Boy, what brat. Last picture, Donald comes home through the pouring rain, soaking wet. As he pushes the key in the lock, he sees uh-uh, his umbrella outside the door where he had left it when he locked the door before going downtown. And Donald feels just like this. <laughs> oh, no wonder Donald felt ashamed after yelling at that man the way he did. Yes, Donald was just lucky the other man didn't have him arrested. Yes, that would have been funny and just too bad if Donald had called the police and they had arrested Donald instead of the other fellow. Yes, <laughs> it just proves you should never <laughs> accuse anyone without being sure you're right. No, you should never accuse anyone without being sure you're right. I should say not. <laughs> okay, now let's go over the page. And look, there's Uncle Remus. Oh, read that, please. Very well, my lady. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, hoppity making, making a habit, habit to give us music for old Brer Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Brer Rabbit ain't got much hankering for lazy critters, and he generally expresses himself exactly. Brer Rabbit comes into town one day, and he sees all the critters lying around on the porches of the stores, sound asleep, filling the air with snores. Brer Rabbit listens and then says, Just look yonder. The whole town sleeping like a nest of alligators. Just listen. My, 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 my. What a racket. It's about time they was woke up. Brer Rabbit listens to the racket thinking a little bit. And then he has a cute idea. He says, This ought to shake them loose from their hibernations. And he runs from one critter to the other and begins to yell, Run! 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 And they all wake up and they shout, Run! Run! And they start running down the road. Run! 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 Oh, <laughs> oh, 
Down the road they run, yelling at the top of their voices, until they're finally exhausted. Her sheriff shouts, Hey, hold up there! Hold up! Hold up! Hey, what is we running for? Br'er Buzzard answers, I don't know. And Br'er Bear says, Us just the, 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 the run. In the last picture, Br'er Rabbit, who was hiding behind a tree, giggled, <laughs> I bet they don't know what they were sleeping for either. And Uncle Rima says, If you insist on doing nothing, uh, you might just as well do lots of it. <laughs> Wasn't that a good joke? Yeah. Just because Bear Rabbit yells, run, everybody jumps up and runs. Yes, it just goes to prove that people often do many things without thinking. <laughs> yes, they do many things without thinking, and if they thought they wouldn't do them, would they? I don't think they would. Oh, now could we read Dick's Adventures? We certainly could, so let's go over to the very last page, and here we are with Dick's Adventures. And Dick is having a wonderful adventure. He's in the early days of America, and he's a sailor in the American Navy. And he's bored? The ship Constitution, which is one of the most famous ships in American history. Yes, and, and last week, Dick's friend had just finished sewing up the captain's britches. And Dick is supposed to take the britches back to the captain. So please, quick, read us so we can meet the captain. Very well, here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. <laughs> Dick is holding up the trousers and looking at them, and he exclaims, Gee, Captain Isaac Hull must be a big man, judging from this. And then he looks up to see Captain Hull standing over him. Oh, oh, oh they're fixed, sir. Last picture, top row. The captain smiles at Dick and says, Well, oh, the British are saying we Yankees are growing too big for our britches, lad. Daring to sail against them for a fight. But we'll soon see. At this moment, first picture, second row. A loud cry from the lookout rouses them both. British frigate on the starboard quarters! The captain shouts, Turn about! Run it all! The American sailors eagerly spring into action to chase the British ship. First picture bottom row. In the gathering twilight, Dick sees that the Britisher has turned tail and is running for light. But the Constitution, with all sails spread, is gaining. Meanwhile, last picture, aboard the pursued enemy frigate. The British captain sees the American ship coming after them. The captain gloats. Well, good, good, jolly good. The Yankees taking our bait. Keep out of range of his guns, but don't let him lose us. Won't he be surprised in the morning? Oh, uh, the British are trying to lead the Americans into a trap, I'll bet you. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Yes, but... But what kind of a trap? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wait until next week to find that out. Oh, this is exciting. Yes, but here's something else that should be exciting. Below Dick's adventures, Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, because Rusty and Pete have finally escaped from the cave where those crooks locked them up. And they've been picked up by a deputy sheriff, and he took them to the sheriff's office, and then they phoned to Mr. Miles. Yes, and now Mr. Miles and the sheriff are sure to be led to the old abandoned house where the crooks are. Oh, and I hope they will capture them. So quick, let's read and see if they do. Very well, here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. At the Milestone Farm, Tex and Mr. Miles climb in their car. Tex asks, Where are we heading for, boss? Uh, somewhere out on the state road, Tex. Sheriff Thurlow and the police will be waiting for us. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the sheriff's office, the sheriff says to Rusty, Pile into my car, you kids. We're going to meet the police and Mr. Miles. And believe me, your story better be on the level. Rusty replies, Of course it is, Sheriff. You'll see. Last picture, top row. The two crooks, Sir Percival and Nobbs, are still searching in the basement of the old abandoned house for the trophies. 
They feel sure the boys have found the trophies and have hidden them somewhere else in the cellar. Suddenly, first picture bottom row, Sir Percival exclaims, Hey, Nobby, uh, look here, under this junk, a cistern. Nobbs exclaims, A cistern, eh? I wait till I get something to fish around in. I saw a rake a couple of minutes ago. Sir Percival takes a rake, and he fishes down into the cistern and draws up a bag with a loot on it. By Jove, I've got it! Hooray! Blinking good luck, I calls it. Come on, Pice, let's clear out of these here parts. At that very moment, outside the house, Rusty is saying to the state troopers and techs, This is the old house, sir. You can get in through the back door. One of the troopers says, last picture. Hey, there's somebody in there, Inspector. I saw a light in one of the cellar windows. And the detective says, Okay, you get everything ready. I'm going in there. I'll give a signal with my flashlight. Then let's have the floodlight right on that back door. Oh, goody, goody, am I glad. Now, now they will catch those crooks, and am I glad, because they were very mean to Rusty. Yes, it looks like they've got the crooks at last, and next week we'll find out for sure. Now, that's all the time I have, but before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Comic Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.